Okay, welcome to Tuesday, everyone. I don't know if you got a chance to read anything about the IPCC's latest report on climate change, but if you didn't, there's no topic better fitted for today's webinar than this one. We urgently need to improve the sustainability of our building stock, and what we're talking about today is certainly one path to doing just that. Today we're going to discuss an overview of changes from LEED 2009 to the LEED version 4 Building Design and Construction Rating System. Now, Some of you might remember we did something like this a few months ago, but that webinar was focused on interior design. Today we're going to go through B, D, and C, and specifically each of the categories of concern, and we're going to map the LEED 2009 credits to the LEED version 4 credits where we can. Now, while we do that, we're also We'll also cover the rationale behind the changes and how these will influence market transformation and building performance. We want to give you a better understanding of the new system and hopefully increase your confidence in using it. Our guest today is Richard Manning. He's a member of AIA, he's a lead fellow, and he's the technical director for RWDI. Now, what does all that mean? Well, it means he's a seasoned specialist in sustainable design and construction who has delivered high performance projects across many sectors and industries, from healthcare and education to commercial and industrial settings. In addition to his deep, deep technical understanding of green building approaches, including passive house design and lead certification standards, Richard brings 30 years of architecture and design experience to his client work. Known for his strong communication and collaboration skills, Richard has led hundreds of projects across North America and Asia, and has delivered sustainable building solutions for a diverse range of clients in both the public and private sectors. <clears throat> now, before we get rolling today, I have to tell you about PowerShift by NV Energy. You can never save too much energy or money. That's why NV Energy has introduced PowerShift to help its residential and business customers conserve even more energy and save money on their power bills. PowerShift by NV Energy is also about providing you with excellent customer service. It's your one-stop shop to find all the energy efficient products and services to help you boost your bottom line along with convenient ways to manage your account. PowerShift Energy Advisors are dedicated to working side-by-side -side with business customers to discuss their needs and to find energy efficiency solutions that save money. Plus, their Business Solutions Center is the place to go to discuss your bill payments and account-related questions. For more information, please visit nvenergy.com slash PowerShift. Now, during the course of today's presentation, you can submit questions for our guest. For those of you who haven't been here before, you use the questions box on the right side of your screen. I'm going to review those questions and I'm going to pose those to Richard during the Q&A time that we've set aside after his presentation. Richard, we're all ears. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to go through uh, changes to lead version 4, BD and C. Um, there's a lot of changes. We're really going to talk about just the credits that changed significantly. So I hope uh, if you're in this webinar, you have some understanding of the previous version of LEED because um, we're not going to really talk about the previous version, but just the credits that changed um, kind of significantly. Um, there's me. Hi. Um, uh, this um, uh, presentation is available for AIA credits so we can help you with certificates uh, or whatever you need to to get those credits um, this is our learning objectives uh, we're going to discuss kind of the overreaching changes in the structure and content to the lead uh, uh, v4 rating system um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the integrated design credit um, we'll talk about some of the changes especially in the materials and um, and um, the low emitting materials uh, credits and then we're going to talk about a little bit about a, a case study um, to show the uh, on lead version, version 4 project. Here's our agenda. Uh, what's new with 4? An overview of all the credits that changed significantly in the case study. So let's jump right in. Uh, why did lead change it anyway? I mean, it seemed like it was hard enough um, to begin with. Um, you may know lead started about uh, 2000. Actually, we did our first uh, lead project back in 2001 um, and then after lead started it was kind of for you know new construction office building but then um, you know all these committees got together and said oh we need a home uh, a lead for corn shell oh we need a lead for commercial interiors for existing buildings for homes for schools for retail healthcare I and mean, all these rating systems had different points uh, available a lot of different credits um, and so in 2009 the USGBC came up with lead uh, version three or lead version 2009. 
we kind of standardized all those and gave us a consistent point threshold. Um, and then lead version four didn't really change any of that, but just made the uh, credits. Um, there's some new categories. They made the credits a little bit more stringent and more of a cycle, uh, a focus on life cycle um, than uh, just um, material components. So here's kind of what was happening. You can see the the yellow bars here are gold buildings, and you know from 2006, 2007, you know it was pretty few gold buildings. But then uh, as designers uh, and owners got more, more familiar with lead, and as codes like ASHRAE and uh, California uh, Energy Code got more stringent, um, teams started just getting lots of gold uh, projects. Um, and so the USGBC said, well, it's time to to make our our rating system a little bit more stringent, um, you know, and make sure we're better than code. <clears throat> We've done some studies uh, for the city of Portland and for some other owners uh, about what are the costs of going to leave version four. And we've seen that the construction costs um, are not that significant over a lead uh, 2009 project um, because a lot of things are are just keeping up with codes in some states uh, or a little bit exceeding codes. But we haven't seen a big cost in construction costs. But we have seen substantial soft costs, um, uh, especially research for you know rewriting specifications to include uh, environmental product declaration forms and the different low emitting materials. There's additional uh, commissioning requirements. Um, there's a credit now for acoustics that that uh, can be costly. Um, there's uh, site analysis, there's an integrated design credit now. Um, we used to do a lot of lead uh, sherbats or lead design workshops, but now it's a credit. Um, and then um, shoebox modeling is part of that uh, integrated design credit. So there's just a lot more analysis in lead version four than there was in lead version three. One of the things that got easier though on the site lighting credits, uh, you don't necessarily need to do a photometric analysis anymore. That's That one got kind of prescriptive, but we'll we'll get to that. So don't fear the four. A lot of people go, oh, it's going to be ver lead version four. What are we going to do? But, um, you know, just like any other rating system, when it's new, it's harder. And then you go through it a couple of times. You're like, oh, OK, we can we can handle this. We've done it before. So what's new is that there's uh, some new impact categories. Uh, we'll look at that. Uh, increased rigor on energy efficiency, water, uh, some of the other components of lead. Um, they did uh, provide more, more market sectors. So specific credit compliance path for more market sectors, which is helpful. Uh, and uh, if you get a new lead reference guide or lead scorecard from USDBC, there'll be no credit numbers on it, which I don't know why they did that, but it really makes it hard to find or to use shorthand. So additional market sectors, um, you can see for lead for new um, uh, building design and construction. You can see there's uh, now market um, com uh, compliance Paths for data centers, for hospitality, for warehouses, multifamily high rise, and mid rise. I mean, um, and you can see even for lead for uh, existing buildings and lead for interiors. They uh, and so what they did is that each of the credits, if you went through the reference guide, each of the credits, um, if if there is a different compliance path for warehouse, it'll have a little uh, paragraph there. So if you're doing a warehouse or distribution center, you can comply this way, and that has helped because some of those. Um, building types like data centers and warehouses and distribution centers were very difficult before, so they gave us a little bit, made that a little bit easier on us. Okay, so we're going to talk about new and revised credits. We're kind of jumping into the meat of our presentation. Um, so lead version three or lead version 2009, these are the uh, areas of conce concern. But in V4, we've added two new ones, uh, integrative process, which is really only one credit, and then the location and transportation uh, category of concern that really what they really did is they took the sustainable sites credits from lead version 2009 and broke them up uh, into two different categories of concern. Uh, the structure is the same, um, still 110 possible points, uh, still 40 to certified, 50 to silver, 60 to gold, and then that leap up to 80 um, to get to platinum. So that didn't change. So that's good. We're all happy that that didn't change. Okay, so this is the scorecard, um, or at least part of the scorecard, and the credits uh, with the blue bars on them, those are the ones I'm gonna talk about in this presentation. Those are the ones that changed pretty significantly um, from previous versions, from the previous version. Um, 
And so we'll talk about integrated design process, uh, a couple of sustainable design, sustainable sites credits, um, energy and atmosphere, because there were some changes there. Uh, materials and resources, those that's probably the biggest change in lead version four is in the materials and resources um, credits, and we'll we'll talk about those in more detail. And then you can see um, indoor environmental quality credits. So we've got a lot to go through uh, in a short amount of time. So I'll try not to race too fast, but uh, we'll get through here. <clears throat> okay, so there's a credit for uh, integrated design process. It was always a good idea, um, but lead suggested that you do it, but they never gave you credit for it before. Um, and so they've come up, there's a, there's a standard for uh, integrated process that they reference, an ANSI standard, which is helpful. It's, it's much bigger than the um, actual credit requirements, but it is good guidance on that. Uh, and one of the things that we need to do is do preliminary energy and water uh, analysis and uh, make sure you understand how that's gonna inform the uh, owner's project requirements. So uh, this integrated process credit requires some very early uh, energy modeling. So we do a shoebox energy model. That's kind of looking at the building energy performance before you know any of, of the systems that are going to be in it. You might know the wall systems. You might know the window wall ratios. Um, but that's really all you know. And so you can look at uh, kind of passive systems like uh, insulation, uh, glazing types, size of glazing, size of opens, and especially massing and orientation. We also usually do a bioclimatic analysis. Where's the prevailing winds? Uh, where's the sunrise? Where's it setting at different times of the year? Uh, how much uh, precipitation do we get? Can we collect some of that water? Is there enough um, to collect it for plumbing or for irrigation? When do we get, you know, what times of year does the rain fall? So a lot of things just looking at the site uh, and what does the site uh, provide you in terms of opportunities for energy efficiency or for water efficiency. Um, there's a cost to doing an integrative uh, design charrette. Um, we usually get the whole design team together with the owner, the design team, maybe some user groups, uh, maybe your utility or energy specialist um, uh, coming in. Uh, we usually, depending on the project, it's, it could be three hours, it could be eight hours, it could be a day and a half, depending on the size and scope and complexity of a project. Um, so it's a, you know, for the owner, it's a hurdle, but we see value in it because it does give us a leg up on things that we're going to have to do anyway, like energy modeling, like daylighting analysis, water efficiency. There's a credit for site assessment that we'll talk about that we might want to do before the charrette. Um, so even though there's costs involved with the charrette, uh, it does, um, I guess, save costs that you were going to you're going to pay for them anyway. You're just going to pay for those things at a later uh, time. So it just kind of moves more of the costs up front. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we've been through this a lot. We do a lot of these kind of uh, charrettes or design workshops. We think building a strong team in the pre-design uh, makes a big difference because teamwork really matters on projects. Uh, the bioclimatic analysis can affect a lot of disciplines from landscape to civil um, to energy uh, and plumbing. Uh, it's a good idea that we can quickly establish what strategies we want to focus on and what strategies are not um, probably that worth pursuing uh, so we don't waste time um, uh, pursuing kind of dead ends. <clears throat> like I said, we get an earlier start on tasks that we're going to do anyway, um, and there's more value in that. Um, it's, it's better to have an energy model in the schematic design phase or conceptual design phase uh, than waiting to the end of DD and using it more as a verification model. We, we want to, this credit is encouraging using energy modeling as a design tool. <clears throat> and we like to come out of a charrette like that with a set of design principles for moving forward um, so that uh, we kind of know what the values of the owner and the team are. And uh, it kind of gives us guidelines to make decisions against. And then we'll have this initial workshop, but then uh, in each phase of design, we'll get together um, to review our Charette report and review uh, how we're proceeding against our, our goals from that. So it's just not a one-time thing. <clears throat> okay, so that's one. That's worth one point. Um, there's another 
credit here um, called Site Assessment. This is a new credit in LEED, um, and it's to evaluate uh, the site before you start work, um, looking at topography, hydrology, climate and vegetation on a site, um, any human uses, was it pre-developed, are there kind of ad hoc pathways through there that might inform the design? Um, are there any endangered species uh, or, or you know plants or animal species on the site? Um, you know, most architects, when they get a site, will go visit it and look for these kind of things anyway. So um, we don't see this one as being a big hurdle to do. You just, uh, the USGBC provided a form uh, in Lead Online that you have to fill out to do the site assessment. And we usually like to do this before the charrette as well, so we have all this information. <clears throat> Okay, one of the credits that changed a lot was heat island reduction. You know, in lead version 2009, there were two points here, one for site and one for roof. Um, now they've combined them into one uh, credit. So you have to meet both strategies to earn the points. You can't, there's two points, uh, but you can only earn both of them. You can't just say, oh, my roof complies, but my site doesn't. Um, so that's more stringent there. Um, and then they've, the SRI value for the roof and paving materials um, has gotten uh, more stringent. The low slope roof is a SRI of uh, 64 and a steep of 32. Um, so that, that changed quite a bit. Um, the, the calculations for this are crazy. Um, I'm only showing you this because uh, usually we don't do calculations in this, but you look at the area of your non-roof measures and you divide it by 0.5 and you look at the area of your uh, <clears throat> high reflectance roofing and you divide that by 0.75 and then your area of vegetative roof divide that by 0.75 well we all know from math that when you divide by a fraction dividing by 0.5 is the same as multiplying by two so i don't know why they did it this way but anyway what what i'm trying to show on the slide is that to demonstrate compliance you're Compliant roof area, in other words, the left-hand side of that equation, uh, has to be greater and equal than your actual roof area. You can see my when I total the left side up, it's 30,667 square feet, but my actual total roof area is only 24,000 square feet. So it's kind of a USGBC math thing. Uh, I'm not sure why they did it that way, but um, but you can see you're looking at uh, areas of non-roof, areas of reflected roof, and areas of vegetating roof. And that area has to exceed uh, the total paving area plus the total roof area. <clears throat> so a little tricky way they did that. Uh, there is a, another option on this credit to get one point, and that's by having 75% of the parking spaces under cover, either a roof or you know underground. <clears throat> can be covered with photovoltaics, can be covered with a vegetated roof, or it could be under the building. <clears throat> Okay, one of the credits that got a little bit easier is this light uh, pollution reduction credit. In LEED version 2009, we needed to do a site photometric study and we had to show kind of the foot candles at 15 feet beyond the property line and um, it got kind of complicated and, and site photometric drawings, you know, it's lots of little tiny numbers. Uh, it was kind of hard to see if, if you were making it. Um, now they've come up with a prescriptive path called the BUG method. BUG stands for backlight, uplight, and glare. You can still use a calculation method using site photometrics, um, but uh, but the easiest way is to use this bug, bug method. And so the bug method divides uh, a light fixture up into uh, different zones, looking at backlight and uplight and glare. And these bug allowances are per lighting zone. So if you're a lighting zone two, you know you know lighting zones like Times Square is probably lighting zone five, and and uh, you know if you're out in a national park somewhere, that's lighting zone zero. Um, but if you're a suburban place, say in it's lighting zone two, uh, then you'd have to look at your light fixtures that you got from your manufacturer, your your cut sheets from the manufacturers, then they should have the bug rating on them, and you just make sure that those bug ratings comply with the uh, lead credit requirements. And so they kind of look like this. Um, there's also uh, a maximum lumens uh, requirement for that. Um, and so this credit actually got a little bit easier because it's more prescriptive. Uh, so yay, one got easier. 
Okay, so I ran through those site credits pretty quick. Um, but those were the significant changes on sites. Uh, location and transportation. So this was a new credit uh, category. Um, but a lot of the credits in this used to be in the sustainable sites, like access to quality transit used to be, you know, there's a credit if you had two bus stops within a quarter mile. Well, now they've made that one more stringent uh, because they want to encourage even more um, uh, transportation options for people. So you still have to be uh, within a quarter mile of a transit stop or half a mile of a mass transit station. But now there's uh, frequency requirements. So um, it doesn't matter how many bus stops are within a quarter mile of your site. There need to be 72 weekday trips and 40 weekend trips uh, for one point. And if you're in a neighborhood that has 144 weekday trips or 108 weekend trips, uh, you get two points. So, you know, getting those two points, that's like you've got to be downtown of a major city where there's lots of transit uh, opportunities um, to get those points. Uh, most of the kind of smaller suburban um, projects, uh, you know, if you're a, a warehouse pretty far out, um, in the burbs, you probably won't get this credit. It's uh, it's much more stringent. <clears throat> this used to be a pretty easy one. Find the two bus stops, you win. And now find the two bus stops, and then you have look at the bus schedule, and you have to see how many times the bus comes, and uh, it's much more complicated. <clears throat> the biking facilities credit also got a little bit more complicated. Um, they've just added one more requirement. There has to be a bicycle network. So the amount of bike storage and the amount of shower rooms uh, didn't really change. Um, you still need two and a half percent for peak visitors, but a minimum of four uh, bike parking places. And then there's long-term uh, bike parking for 5% of the regular occupants, but a minimum of four. And then there's one shower per 100 occupants, um, and then an additional shower per the next 150 occupants. So, so they kind of change that a little bit. But the big thing is you have to be near a bicycle network, um, and so that includes, uh, you know, designated bike paths or paths that are designated along the side of a road, uh, or it can be a street network that's uh, 25 miles an hour or less. So, kind of residential streets, um, and those are all considered bike networks. Uh, but again, you, you can't automatically get this credit uh, unless you have that bike network uh, nearby. So this one's a little tougher to get again. Again, USGBC uh, encouraging uh, more dense uh, urban environments. <clears throat> okay, so those were the two biggest changes in the sites. Most of the sustainable site credits are pretty much uh, the same as they were before. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Water efficiency, um, you know, in LEED, I always thought water was uh, kind of not, um, there wasn't enough focus on LEED in the, uh, enough focus on water in the LEED um, rating system. And so they did uh, kind of uh, improve that a little bit. Um, we still want to use water, uh, you know, we're still trying to get below a baseline and it's still the Energy Policy Act of 1992 that didn't change that standard. Um, and it does affect uh, toilets, urinals, faucets, shower heads, uh, uh, you know, a few a few appliances like uh, spray nozzles and, and those kind of things. Um, but the new requirement is that um, plumbing fixtures need to be have a water sense label on them. So that's uh, that's a credit requirement now. Water sense. Water sense is sort of like Energy Star, but for water. And if you look in the catalogs now, you'll see a lot of plumbing fixtures. Um, that have the water sense label, so it's not too hard to get them. Um, it's just that uh, you have to make sure you have one. Also, they increase the amount of points for water. Um, there used to be, um, and now there's up to uh, six points. So you get uh, there's a there's a prerequisite for water use reduction. Um, you have to be at least 20% better than the Energy Policy Act of uh, 1992, um, and, but then you get one point for 25%, another point for 30%, uh, and additional points up to 50% savings. So you can get up to six points for water uh, efficiency. So that's um, that's helpful, and I think it puts water more uh, where it should be uh, in terms of the lead rating system. 
um, move on to energy. Um, buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of all energy consumed in the United States. Uh, Mike mentioned that uh, report uh, regarding climate change that just was released. And, uh, you know, as architects, building designers, building owners, we have a big opportunity to make a dent in this uh, really fast. Uh, we're getting to the point where we can make zero net energy buildings, uh, you know, uh, and it's going to be code in some places in just a few few years. So, um, you know, we, we can make a big impact. <clears throat> So in the energy side, there's just, uh, um, we still have the fundamental um, commissioning and verification as a prerequisite. Um, there's a little bit more requirements to it. Um, there's this commissioning um, uh, current facilities uh, requirements and operations and maintenance plan. Those are kind of new. So this, um, this current facilities and operations and maintenance plan is a document um, that includes the sequence of operations, building occupancy schedule, includes all the set points for HVAC equipment, including you know outside air requirements, and it talks about different lighting levels throughout the building. So this is um, <clears throat> current facilities. So if in five years the owner wants to go back and recommission that building, because um, they they drift out of out of prime operations just like a new car does or anything else. Um, so if they owner wanted to go back and get his building back to the way it was operating right when it was brand new, that's what this current facilities and operations and maintenance plan allows. Um, so it's one one more document that the um, commissioning agent gets to uh, put together. Uh, usually, you know, this gets in the, speci uh, the commissioning specifications. Um, usually, we put a lot of this uh, on the um, team that's putting together operations and maintenance plan. Uh, and, and usually, uh, a lot of times, it's just an update to the commissioning plan. So there's lots of ways you can get there, but uh, that's a new requirement. <clears throat> I don't think this is too much um, a, a different uh, systems narrative describing the mechanical systems, a preventative maintenance plan. So this is a continuation of uh, what was this is a continuation of this list. Um, there's also a preventative maintenance plan for some of the equipment um, and a program that includes periodic uh, commissioning requirements and ongoing commissioning tasks. So you can, <clears throat> the owner, when they get their new building, they have a plan, they know where, what its existing conditions were, and they kind of have a plan in place that if they were going to retro commissioning the building, um, they know what needs to be done and what equipment to look at. <clears throat> Now, in enhanced commissioning, um, again, there's some new requirements. Um, there's several options now in enhanced commissioning. This is option one, path one, which is worth three points. Um, and most of this is the same as the original commissioning, do an OPR, BOD, review submittals, uh, make sure that the system manual requirements are in the construction documents, make sure that owner operating training. Um, but then we have to verify Seasonal training, it used to be a 10 month return at the end of warranty, but now it's seasonal training. So if you commission the building in the summertime, you should come back in the winter, or if you commission in the wintertime, you should come back in the summer. And then there's also a requirement to, on, to develop an ongoing commissioning plan. And so this is in addition to that current facilities uh, plan that we talked about. So they're really trying to encourage long-term maintenance of these buildings. And then there's option one, path two, which is uh, enhanced and monitoring based commissioning. So the credit for measurement and verification uh, kind of came out. Uh, it's not around in lead version four, um, but there is a credit for, well, we'll talk about a credit for uh, advanced metering, but the uh, monitoring based commissioning uh, means that you, um, if the owner's putting in a measurement and verification plan, you, the commissioning agent has to verify what points are being measured and how they're being measured and is that going to provide the information uh, that the owner needs on their energy and water use. And then the third um, part of enhanced commissioning is called option two envelope commissioning. So it's a credit, not a prerequisite, and it's worth two points. Um, and it's 
follows the guideline zero, just like the rest of the commissioning um, standard. Um, and you have to do the you know fundamental commissioning, and then for enhanced commissioning, you review contractor submittals for the building uh, enclosure. Um, also make sure that there's this, the building enclosure is in the systems manual and training requirements uh, in the spec. Um, again, verify seasonal testing. If there's windows that are supposed to automatically open in the summertime, or there's um, louvers or things that are supposed to operate, we want to make sure that the um, that the buildings uh, working properly. Also, if uh, you know if you're doing um, envelope commissioning in the summertime, you might want to come back in the winter time and see how that building's performing under snow and ice and those kind of things. <clears throat> so you can see there's six points now available for enhanced commissioning. There's three points for enhanced commissioning, kind of the standard one, and then there's a point for monitoring base commissioning, and then two additional points for uh, envelope commissioning. So up to four, or up to six points. Minimum energy performance, this one changed a lot. We have a higher standard, but a lower threshold. So we have to uh, meet the ASHRAE 90.1 2010 standard, which is quite a bit more stringent uh, than the 2007 standard from the lead version 2009. So it's it's harder to get energy efficiency, but you can see we start earning um, for the prerequisite, we just need to show 5% improvement over that code uh, for new construction. In 2009, it was 14%. So standards higher, but the threshold's lower. And so um, that uh, helps a lot on compliance uh, with this. And you know, usually we'll do this, uh, our preliminary energy modeling back in our integrated design workshop, and we'll set a uh, uh, energy use intensity um, you know, on, on BTU per square foot per year. And that's our goal. We find that that's a better goal than saying, oh, we're gonna be you know, 20% more efficient than the ASHRAE standard. We think shooting for a KBT per square foot goal uh, is a little bit easier on all the designers to, to try and get there. So I said there wasn't a credit for uh, measurement and verification, uh, but there is a credit for advanced metering. Um, and so we want to meter um, any system that uses more than 10% of the total energy use. So when we do our energy model, we usually get an energy use breakdown pi. And if lighting is more than 10% of the energy use, we'll want a submeter on the lighting panels, HVAC panels. As we're getting more zero net energy buildings, um, we also want to uh, make sure we're capturing plug loads because plug loads are becoming way more than 10%. When you squeeze all the other energy use down, uh, plug loads become a, a higher percentage. So advanced metering, uh, instead of measurement and verification, it's just uh, advanced metering. And then it combines with kind of the uh, commissioning credit on um, monitoring-based commissioning. So those kind of work together. <clears throat> there's uh, always been a green power credit, but now there's green power and carbon offsets. So there's two different pathways that you can get there. <clears throat> One of the... Uh, Requirements though for lead, uh, not just for this credit, but for any uh, lead building is that um, when you sign up for a lead building, uh, the owner is promising to provide five years of energy use data um, to the USGBC so they can see how effective their program is. <clears throat> but for the uh, green power and carbon offsets, it used to be a two year requirement, now it's a five year requirement. So that one changed pretty much. And now there's a credit too for demand response. Um, this is a new credit in the energy section. And demand response is a program that lots of utilities have um, where during peak season, so like California, many of the California utility programs have a demand response uh, program. Uh, and so in peak summer, when everybody's running their air conditioning, rather than develop new generation to cover that spike, the utility makes agreements with big, sometimes industrial uh, facilities, sometimes hospitals um, uh, or, or large campuses. But the utility can reach in and dim their lights by 10% or fire up their um, backup generator or some other kind of uh, 
strategy to uh, help them through that spike. Rather than having enough power plants built to deal with a spike that's going to happen for you know, a few hours in an afternoon, um, they have uh, a deal with different building owners to sign them up for demand response. So if you uh, can sign up for that, if you have a utility that lets you, that has that program and you sign up for it, you get a point for having a one-year contract where you promised that uh, about 10% of your peak load, uh, the owner can reach in and, and tweak. It has to be automatic. So it has to be connected to your building automation system. It's not just where they call you up and say, hey, you know, turn down your air conditioner four degrees or two degrees, uh, but it has to be automatic. Now, in some places um, where a demand response is not available, uh, lots of utilities, most utilities don't have demand response programs, you have to set up your building automation systems so that at some point it could uh, work in a um, demand response program. And you have to have a plan for if you were going to shed 10% of your building load, uh, what would you do it? How would you do it? <clears throat> So it is achievable um, in places without demand response, but it does require a um, building automation system where the utility could reach in and, and make an automatic change. Okay, materials and resources. This is where uh, lead changed a lot, and this has been quite a hurdle for us on some projects um, because there's some new requirements and a lot of um, owners aren't there yet but it, or, uh, manufacturers aren't there yet but it's amazing how much uh, once uh, one manufacturer in a sector uh, starts to get the lead documentation they needed the others seem to follow so you know leads all about market transformation and so that's why they're making a change to these materials and resources credits to push manufacturers a little bit so now they're called building product disclosure and optimization credits that's a mouthful, um, or BPDO, which is also a bad, a, a mouthful of an acronym. Uh, but building product disclosure and optimization credits. Uh, so what they did is they took all of the lead version three or lead version 2009 credits. Remember, we had all these nice credit numbers like uh, materials reuse, MR credit three, materials reuse, MR credit four, recycled content, MR credit five, regional materials, MR credit six, rapidly renewable, and MR credit seven, certified wood. Well, those are all gone. And now there's um, all those went into one credit called uh, sourcing of raw materials. I'm sorry, there shouldn't be a credit number there because sometimes we can't get away from that shorthand. But all those went into one credit called sourcing of raw materials. Um, and there's raw materials source and extraction reporting or leader in, leadership and extraction practices. Um, the reporting is where all that regional recycled content and rapidly renewable materials go. Then leadership and extracted extraction practices is where certified wood goes, but they're all under um, one credit now. <clears throat> so that changed quite a bit. So the first uh, BPDO credit is environmental product declarations. And environmental product declarations are kind of a summary of a life cycle analysis of a product. And so there's an there's a ISO standard for how manufacturers uh, develop these things, so they can't just make up documentation. Um, but it's uh, basically a summary of a life cycle analysis that looks at um, how much energy does it take to make a product? How much renewable energy is it? How much water does it use? How much eutrophication, you know, water pollution? How much smog is generated? And there's five or six key uh, components. And so we could compare, say, two different ceiling tile manufacturers, say Armstrong and Certainty. Uh, and they could both make environmental product declaration forms. And we could compare, oh, who uses more energy in their product? Who uses more water? Uh, who has more, you know, carbon emissions? Now, you're probably not going to select materials based on those components. You're going to select them because of their acoustic capability, their look, their availability, you know, all these other kind of products. You're not going to go, I don't like the way that one looks, but it's got a much lower carbon footprint. Um, but what we're, but what the USGBC is doing is it's about material manufacturer transparency. So we're not scoring them like, oh, you have to have a certain level of carbon emissions or a certain level of water you know use 
Uh, there's nothing like that. It's just about getting the information. It's about manufacturer transparency. And so we need to get these EPD forms uh, uh, for manufacturers, environmental product declaration forms. <clears throat> now, just to make it a little bit more complicated, the USDBC gave us two compliance paths. Um, we recommend, oops, okay, we recommend doing this option one for one point, get 20 EPD forms from at least five manufacturers. Um, and there's two types. There's ones that where a particular manufacturer makes an EPD form about their particular product. And then there's industry-wide ones where like the um, American Woodworkers Association, I don't know, um, makes it industry-wide like in a, in a uh, uh, you know, piece of particle board, they they generally uh, they they say this is the general environmental impacts, although it's not specific. <clears throat> and if a project's within uh, 100 miles of the site, you get you get to get counted twice. And a product is like uh, when it comes to metal framing, a, a six-inch stud, a four-inch stud, are different products. Um, you know, a, a hat channel and a and a Zeger are all different products. So you need 20 forms from at least five different manufacturers, but some of those things can be pretty easy to get. There's another credit for um, sourcing of raw materials. I talked a little bit about this one. Um, this is where you, you, all your um, recycled content, regional materials, certified wood. <clears throat> Again, there's two options for this one. Um, option one is getting CSR reports from five different manufacturers, and it's very complicated. So on this credit, we suggest doing option two leadership and extraction practices. Um, this is where you need material cost, um, but uh, and it's 25%, so it went up from 10% to 25%. But the cost of all materials for recycled content, reused materials, certified wood, uh, SAN is a sustainable agricultural network for uh, wheat board and those kind of things. So again, so this one's all those things that used to be MR credits, three, four, five, and six, and seven are now in this one credit. And then finally, there's a materials credit uh, for material ingredients. And on this credit, we're looking for health product declaration forms. And they're similar to environmental product declaration forms, but it looks at material ingredients and the health effects of a material ingredients. And again, this is about manufacturer transparency. It's not about a threshold for what types of materials are in a product. There's no banning any types of materials. There's no materials red list. Uh, it's just getting manufacturers to be transparent about what is in their products. And the thought being that this idea of market transformation that um, you know when people are more transparent, then consumers can make better selections about, about what's in there. This one, they gave us three options. I think USGBC thinks they're helping us by giving us more options, but I think more options sometimes makes it more complicated. Uh, anyway, on this one, we uh, think the first option, the material and ingredient reporting, is the easiest one to get. Again, it's 20 products from at least five manufacturers. Um, and we look for these health product declaration forms. Again, they're becoming more um, common, easier to get. There's some other ones, declare label, creator, creator certification, uh, BIFMA for furniture. Um, the other options are much more uh, difficult to specify and difficult to get. Um, the screen screen assessment, 100%, 50% of cost. I mean, it's much more complicated. <clears throat> and then option three is really looking at supply chain transparency. And, th and that's a very complicated one too, and really tough to specify. So we would say, uh, we always recommend you go with option one on these. Uh, they're gonna be more successful. And um, believe me, contractors, they only want to track one option. Don't tell them all there's three options and track them all and we'll figure it out at the end. Specify it one way and um, and, and they'll track it and you'll have a much better uh, success rate. <clears throat> so when we um, look at specifications, it's really important to review specifications for these environmental product declaration forms and health declaration forms. And we uh, usually look at a division one spec for sustainability requirements um, and put that in there. And then we'll also make sure we look at each of the technical sections where we want these. Remember, you only need 20 of them uh, from five different manufacturers. So 
uh, you can, you know, you can double it, you can get an innovation credit, but, um, you know, so you can really specify, select where that's going to be. And then for low emitting materials, we'll talk about low emitting materials when we get in there, but also that's a really important uh, thing to specify in the specs. Um, and then there's a lot of third party certifications. Uh, there's more third party certifications than there used to be, but we'll get to that when we get to uh, that. We kind of talked about those. <clears throat> so this is kind of what a um, EPD is. Um, it, you declare the environmental impacts. Um, it kind of looks like a nutrition label. Um, this is sort of the summary of an EPD. It's usually, you know, there's seven or eight pages that go with it. But this is what it looks at. Primary energy demand, how much renewable energy, a global warming potential, acidification, eutrophication, which is uh, water pollution from nitrogen, uh, ozone depletion potential, and smog. And so you can look at different batches of concrete, you can look at different ceiling tiles, and they'll have different um, components of that. But they should have the same unit, like this one's looking at one cubic yard of concrete you know whether it's one ceiling tile or one square foot of ceiling tile they'll all be you know the same standard so you can uh, compare them lots of new acronyms you get to learn one thing about usgbc they love acronyms and there's just a environmental part of declaration uh, that's iso uh, version of that and there's all different kinds of types of EPDs. Um, there's product-specific ones. Um, there's industry-wide generic ones. Um, and the industry-wide ones are only worth half a point, And the product-specific ones are worth a full point. So if you're going all industry-wide ones, you would need 40 instead of 20. And then the um, health product declarations, um, they have to list all the uh, material ingredients um, down to a certain kind of threshold and they have to list them kind of like food labels the most uh, highest percentage ingredient first um, and then a VOC content and then if there's any kind of accessory materials that go with it for cleaning or operations or maintenance of it they all get included okay so that part uh, you might if you're doing a lead project and you're going to be the lead um, Administrator on that one, you might really want to bone up on those uh, materials credits and uh, especially specify them. Okay, low emitting materials. Okay, so this one they made very complicated. Um, not only are we looking at VOC content like we always have, but now we have to look at VOC emissions. So content is in grams per liter, which you're probably all familiar with that if you've done a lead project before. But m emissions are in micrograms per hour. And the VOC to, to um, products have to have been tested by the California Department of Public Health Standard Method version 1.1, 1 .1, 2010. So that's a new reference standard. Um, so it's not good enough that they have low VOC content. We also have to look at the submissions. And emissions data is not that easy to find. <clears throat> So we're still looking at the same kind of materials, uh, paints and coatings, adhesives and sealants, flooring, composite wood. Uh, they added ceilings, walls, and insulation, and furniture. Um, and so you can see there's a threshold for paints and coatings. You have to beat up. 100% of them have to meet the VOC content, and 90% of them have to meet the VOC emissions. Uh, we always think this 90% is going to get us off the hook um, for some of the ones that are more difficult to find. but it's 90% of the total uh, volume. So if you show every material complies, 100% of the materials comply with content and 100% comply with emissions, then you don't have to do any kind of calculations. But if we want to say that 90% are complying with emissions, then you have to do these calculations because it's 90% by volume. So it's not 90% of the products, it's 90% of the volume of the products. So it makes it a much more complicated um, calculation. So we just say when we do our specs that every product needs to comply with the content and the emissions. Um, and you can get um, 
you don't have to do all of them, but you have to do uh, three of these, either paints, coatings, that ices and sealants and flooring. If you do three of those categories, you get uh, one point. If you do four, you get two points. If you do five, you get uh, three points. So we uh, have been recently just doing paints and coatings, adhesives and sealants, flooring and composite wood, um, because those are the ones that are easier to get data on, that gets you uh, two points. So for option one, um, so we want the MSDS sheets for VOC content. That's always um, been included. And then for the VOC emissions, um, to show that it complied with that California Health Department standard, they have to, the manufacturer has to have a green guard or CSC or green circle or some other um, third party certification that they met that standard. And that's what's we found really frustrating. It should be if the manufacturer says they've had it tested by that standard, why do we need the backup third party documentation? But that's what they've been asking for. Um, and that's uh, really makes the documentation uh, much more um, well, harder to get. Now, you can also do it by um, budget method for low emitting materials, but then you have to do all the calculations um, of all the um, content. So, you know, how many tubes of sealant did you use? How many gallons of paint? Uh, you know, all those kind of things. And then you need to, um, how much, you know, area of sealing tile and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of um, requirements there and that's a lot of calculations. Uh, we, we think leads complicated enough for owners and people and to keep it simple, uh, we try and just specify all the um, components to meet the requirements. Okay, I went through that pretty fast because uh, we're because um, we got a short time. Um, indoor uh, air quality assessment is another um, credit that changed a little bit. There's still the flush out uh, required for a building, um, but you can also do air quality testing uh, in lieu of the flush out. So um, we always suggest you do the flush out. Uh, it's the same rate as lead version three. By the time you do air quality testing, it could be too late um, to fix it and earn the credit. What else I want to say on that? Um, and also, uh, just one of the things um, on the indoor air quality assessment, you know, you want to make sure that you're following the SMACNA guidelines for uh, indoor air quality management plan. That's still a credit in lead version four. I just didn't address it because it didn't change. Um, and then you wanna make sure that there's, um, you know, scheduling in the time in the project schedule to do this flush out because it still has to happen. It has to happen after all the furniture and everything is in now. And um, and then there's still no smoking uh, in the building uh, and no smoking while the building's under construction. Daylight credit changed a lot too. And this one got a lot more complicated. Um, it's not just, uh, you know, 90 for percent of the, you know, the old calculator was kind of the area of the window as a percentage of the area of the floor in a room. Basically, that's what it worked out to. Um, but this one, now it requires uh, simulation. And so we're looking at um, spatial daylight autonomy. And that means um, at least 55% of the building has to be able to be daylit during working hours. Um, and that, that gets you one point. If 75% of the building can just operate on daylight, daylight during working hours, uh, you get another point. If you get up to 90%, that's really hard to do. But basically, spatial daylight autonomy is how much time could you work with basically the electric lights off. But there's also um, a requirement on the other end um, where you can't over daylight a space. So in other words, if there's too much glare in a space, um, you won't earn the credit either. So there's the spatial daylight autonomy, and then there's a glare side. So we use a lot of different software. There's Diva uh, for Rhino, Open Studio, Radiance, um, IES, a lot of different software packages uh, can do that. But there is definitely a cost um, for doing that. And if daylighting credit is something that's important, you really need to do that daylighting study way upfront schematic design because it's going to matter. You know how far away are all the workstations from the windows and where are those windows located and 
Um, you really have to design for daylighting. You can't try and get the daylight credit in CDs. It almost never works. There's a new credit for um, acoustic performance that used to be only in schools. Uh, now it's a prerequisite in the schools rating system, but it's a credit in um, um, BDNC. And it looks at uh, background noise, uh, sound isolation, uh, and reverberation time. So those are the three components. Uh, so, you know, isolating uh, HVAC noise um, and then looking at reverberation time. <clears throat> and then there's also um, STC components for sound transmission coefficients between like offices and hallways and offices and conference room and conference room and conference room. Uh, and so there are some significant calculations required by a uh, acoustic engineer to do this. So it becomes a pretty expensive credit unless you're a building that's already doing some kind of acoustic performance anyway. Okay, only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, regional um, priority credits um, didn't really change too much. Um, well, we have innovation credits. Um, the USGBC is encouraging the use of pilot credits, uh, and a pilot credit is a credit that the USGBC kind of wants to road test. You have to let them know you want to use that credit, and then you have to use it, and then you have to let them know how it worked. Um, so we want to achieve at least one pilot credit because they want to get those uh, out in the field more. And, and to, to find pilot credits, you go to uh, USGBC online and look at their pilot credit catalog. Okay, I'm going to run through one. Uh, we got a minute left. Maybe I'll hold you on another couple of minutes. Um, again, these are some of the definitions that we went through, soft costs, construction costs. Um, so this is a project that we finished, uh, a small branch library. It was our first lead version four project. It finished, well, it started as a lead version three project years ago. Then it went on hold. Then they came back and the owner said, oh, you know, we'd still like to do lead version four. And we said, well, okay, but it's going to cost you a level of certification. You were gold under silver. Um, but I mean, you're gold under lead version three, but you're going to be silver uh, under lead version four. And they said, that's okay. Uh, we're okay with that. This is a uh, FFA uh, design and interface engineering for the engineers. And it's a 16,000 square foot room with about 7,000 square foot uh, reading area. It's located in Boise, uh, happened to be right next to a bike pedestrian green belt. Um, so that was really good. We got that bike, bike networking credit and it happened to be in an area with lots of uh, retail and residential and it's right next to a school there. These are some of the criteria we did a PV ready roof structure, on site water collection, uh, did, did a, a, a low water use uh, demonstration garden, um, you know, pretty much the simple, uh, typical things we would do, uh, bike parking, um, limiting vehicle. This is kind of a inside, you can see it's a CLT uh, ceiling up there. Um, so the things that cost extra were the integrated process uh, charrette, uh, the building level energy metering and advanced metering uh, for water and energy. Um, the optimized energy performance, even though, like I said, the threshold's more stringent, even though we designed this under version three. Uh, it was more stringent standard, but a lower threshold, so it really didn't change our energy um, credits too much. We got our location and transportation credits, mostly because we were near the uh, bike path, which helped us, and we also installed uh, green vehicle parking. And then uh, we got uh, innovation credit for green building education, which seemed appropriate for a library. I'm sorry, I went through that case study in like two minutes, but um, this is going to be uh, my last slide here. But uh, the project, uh, uh, we weren't able to get the lead platinum because of some of the um, site constraints and site credits. Uh, lead version four can cost you two levels of certification, but this time we were at a higher gold and we came up with a, a silver. So that was that was pretty good. Um, the design costs uh, had a bigger impact than construction costs on this project. Um, but that also was because they didn't try and maintain 
gold, if they if they tried to maintain gold certification under lead version four, there would have been more construction costs because they would have had to really push their energy and redesign their energy system. But when they were willing to kind of keep the building the same and take a level of certification, that um, saved them a little bit. Um, and then there's a lot more consulting time and a lot more analysis time on that project. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a quick overview of the biggest changes to lead version four. Like I said, it's the materials credits in the um, low emitting materials credits uh, that, that changed significantly. So I'm going to stop it here. And I think if there's maybe we'll have time for a question or two. That's right. Yes. Uh, if our audience has any questions, please send them in via the questions box on the right side. Uh, Richard, I had uh, just a, one or two here. Um, do you see, you talked before about parking lots and, and one of the things you can do is, is covering um, and people are using PV. Do you see a shift in parking lot design and construction where more people are using uh, photovoltaics as covering for vehicles? Yeah, we are. We're working on a couple of projects, mostly for a couple of projects for the state of California, where the, which are government funded projects, uh, where they're pursuing zero net energy. And so um, you need a lot of room for solar arrays to do that. And so we're seeing uh, site-based uh, solar rather than roof because it's easier to get to and maintain. And also in certain climates, um, it is a great way to shade parking and reduce that heat ion effect. So when you're talking about some lead credits, you're getting kind of a uh, double bang for your buck on that because, yep. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked before about the cost increase from lead 2009 to lead version mm -hmm. four. It was it was early in your presentation. I think you yeah. pegged it at around 2% or so. Yeah. Um, what about those who have never used lead? What's the ramp up there for them? You mean from just from a code building to yeah. to get to 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 a lead uh, compliant building? Exactly. Uh, well, you know it it you know there's lots of ways to get to lead, <laughs> um, yeah, right. and and lots of ways it depends on where your building's uh, located. If you're in a pretty dense urban location, um, you're going to get a lot of credits in those site location transportation credits, and maybe not have to push the energy efficiency uh, credits too much. So you're your costs. Okay. And uh, last question I've got for you, Richard, is um, the switch to lead version four that was finalized in about October 2016. Was that right? Uh oh. Seems we might have lost Richard here. Richard, can you hear us? Well, seems we have some kind of technical difficulty where we may have lost Richard's connection. I will say this though, that um, if you do have questions for Richard, obviously his email address is there on the screen. Um, you can also uh, submit them via the questions box and we will we will get them to Richard as well. Um, I was getting up on to my last question anyway, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, close out today's webinar, but uh, I certainly want to thank Richard for sharing his time and his knowledge with us today, and also to our audience. Uh, thank you for attending, um, and thank you to NV Energy for their generous sponsorship of this and, and many other webinars that we do here. We're going to see you back here, hopefully, in 15 days. Uh, for those of you without a calendar handy, that's October 24. We'll be joined by our friends from Upanor, and we're going to be talking about intelligent water, so I hope you'll join us. It'll be at our usual start time of 2 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a wonderful week and take care.